Hello everybody and welcome back to Making Sense of Revelation for the final part now, part 8. I can't believe we're at the end. But now that we have come to the end, I really want us to, uh, ref having reflected on what we've seen, uh, to nail down on the relevance and application of this book. So I'm not going to be, uh, we're not going to be looking at any specific passages in Revelation today. We're just going to be thinking about how do we apply this in light of what we've seen. You know, you might have uh, come through this and, and seen, okay, this is about the events in the first century. This is about the fall of Jerusalem. And you might be going, okay, so how is this relevant to me? So we're going to look at that. We're going to see how it's relevant and how to apply it. Now, I'm just going to give some some terms now, or, or a term specifically. I've, I've avoided, as we've gone through this, bogging you down with, with theological terms. But for clarity's sake... Uh, I will just tell you the view that I've been explaining as we've gone through this is called the preterist view of revelation or sometimes simply just preterism. It comes from the Latin word preter which just means in the past. So it's the view that revelation is a book about the past. Our past obviously not John's past. So I'm just going to give you that term just so I, I, I can use it and you know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to read two quotes from two theologians who have written very popular commentaries on Revelation. Now, both of these I immensely respect. In fact, one of them is, is one of my absolute favourites. And this is what they say about the preterist view. So, Leon Morris in his commentary on Revelation says, Preterism has the demerit of making Revelation meaningless for all subsequent readers except for the information it gives about that early generation. Uh, G.K. Beale, another one of my, he, this is one of my absolute favourites, and he says, If the preterist view is right, the book becomes irrelevant for anyone who lives after those first days of the church. Why would God include it in the Bible at all? Now, there are some real problems with these quotes, with what they're saying about the preterist view that we've been looking at. Not only are, are all biblical uh, events that happened in the past irrelevant and meaningless, but also they don't belong in the Bible at all. You know, let's just be consistent with this reasoning for a second. The book of Exodus, is it about us? No. Does it mention events that happen in our lifetime? No. Are we ever mentioned in Exodus? No. Is it meaningless to us? No. Does it give us our history and show us the story of God's dealings with his people? Yes. Does it belong in the Bible? Yes. Even though it never mentions us, isn't it about us and doesn't it address us? Is it relevant to us? Yes, of course it is. You know, if someone said Exodus is meaningless to everyone except the Israelite slaves, except for the information it gives us about them, what would you think about that? You know, why don't we apply this logic to any other biblical book? If we were saying that anything that isn't a prophecy for our future is meaningless, irrelevant, and doesn't belong in the Bible, then, you know, let's chuck out Esther, 1 and 2 Kings, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Job, Samuel, Ruth, Joshua, and so on. You know, I could list so many books which we'd have to say aren't relevant to us. Now, bear in mind, there are whole sections, there are whole prophecies about individual nations being destroyed that don't exist anymore as in the nations don't exist anymore, in, in Isaiah and, and the other prophets. So there are judgments on the nation of Tyre and Babylon and so on. Now, these prophecies didn't even directly affect Israel at the time of Jesus, let alone us now. Should we cut these from the Bible? It, it really is a, a ridiculous premise that the books of the Bible that aren't about us are meaningless and irrelevant to us, let alone that they shouldn't be in the Bible. The relevance of a book isn't dependent on how much we can find ourselves in there. But having said that, as we saw, we are in the book of Revelation. It does talk about our present and our future in the last few chapters. But it's not simply good enough for me to say, well, these quotes are wrong. It is relevant. And let's look at why it's relevant. Why is it relevant to us? So the first thing to bear in mind is that without this book we have a big gap in our covenant history. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, bear in mind that when we looked at the temple, we saw it was the absolute centre of worship. It was where everything was done from. Now, nowadays, we don't do that. We don't go to the temple. We don't have priests. We're not in Jerusalem. That is radical. That's a big change in the way that God deals with us. If that just change 
with you know without more than a few sentences in the New Testament. That is odd. Bear in mind in uh, in Amos, Amos chapter three, Amos says this: For the Lord God does nothing without revealing His secrets to His servants, the prophets. But on this occasion, He just moved on. No longer are we centered in Jerusalem, but we don't need to know that. No, thankfully there is no gap. The Lord did reveal it to His servants, the prophets, and we have it for us here in the Book of Revelation. Now just bear in mind, when the first temple was destroyed, which we looked at a little bit in part two, when the first temple was destroyed, it was all over scripture. Now I'm not going to list every Old Testament book that references it, but the point is, if you read through the Old Testament, you will know, you will know very clearly that the, the first temple was destroyed. They talk about it a lot. You will not be able to go through without being told lots of times it's gone. It, it shouts at you. The first temple was gone. But that temple was always going to be rebuilt. In fact, it was rebuilt 70 years later. But are we going to suggest that the second temple managed to fade away, never to be rebuilt again, with just a whisper? You know, oh, and by the way, the temple is coming down. No, it, we, are, we are told in, in Revelation, in Matthew 24 and those other places we looked at, we are told God is removing this building. So there is no gap in our covenant history. The second thing to bear in mind is the temple's destruction is just as relevant to us as it was to the seven churches that Revelation is addressed to. Now, I'll, let me show you what I mean by that. None of the churches that John wrote to were affected by the temple's destruction in the sense that the war stayed in Jerusalem. You know, the Romans never came out to Asia Minor, where they are, they never came and destroyed them. They were persecuted, but the, the temple's destruction didn't change them. But what are they told? In, in chapter 3, verse 12, the church in Philadelphia is told this. The one who is victorious, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. So the temple's destruction is relevant to them because they would become pillars in the new temple. And that same message goes to us as well. We have been made pillars in the new temple. Now, we can't talk about a new temple unless there's such a thing as an old temple. You know, when, when uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, uh, when they, they had to know that the first temple had been destroyed before they got on with building the second one. In the same way, we, we, you know, we talk about the new temple coming because we know that the old temple has been destroyed. Now, I would actually say that if you read the book of Hebrews, you really find the same message in there as the book of Revelation. In fact, I'd say that Hebrews and Revelation are, are twin books. They have the same relevance to us. Both are about how the old system is inferior and must give way to the new. So Hebrews is about why the new is better and so the old must go. Revelation is about how the old will go because the new is here. So that's the that's the relevance of the book to us. You know, there's no gap in our covenant history. The old temple coming down means the new one which we're a part of is coming in. And it's the same message as the book of Hebrews. So how do we apply it then? What's the application? And I think there's there's three, uh, maybe two points of application, really. I think a, a big thing to bear in mind is that a book in the Bible may have one meaning, but many applications. So, for instance, if you think about that parable that Jesus told about the, the two sons who one was asked to come and, and work and said, no, I'm busy, and then came. The other was asked and said, yeah, OK, and then never came. Now, if you read that in context, that's a parable about Israel. It's a parable about Israel were, were God's people and they didn't come when Jesus came. But the Gentiles who said no, you know, they're the son who said no, they did come. And lots of Jesus' parables are about Israel. And yet, when I was a, a teenager and dad asked me to do something and I didn't do it, and he told me this parable, I can't turn to him and say, you, how dare you use it out of context? That's about Israel and the Gentiles. No, there's one meaning to that parable, but there's lots of applications. In the same way, Revelation has one meaning. It's about the fall of Jerusalem and the reign of Christ. But it has lots of different applications for us. So we can take the same encouragement that John's audience took, for instance, 
about uh, persecuting governments or empires. You know, when they rise and persecute us, just as the the first beast did, uh, we know that it won't get its way. And just as the other beast arose and then was destroyed, we know that Christ is ruling so that any new opposing kingdom will be dismantled. We have the same call as John's audience to persevere through suffering. We don't, we're not going through the same suffering as them, but it, we have the same attitude to it. We have the same knowledge of them that Jesus is on the throne. So there's lots of applications in there, even if there is only one meaning. A very significant application, which I touched on earlier, is that we often take for granted the fact that we are no longer a geopolitical nation. You know, we don't have a, a center point of worship. We aren't made up by a majority of one race. We're not a country. We can really take this for granted sometimes. When we read the Old Testament, we are reading about God's people as a nation with its own justice system, taxation system, order of society. Clearly, that's not the same thing as the church. The church is not a nation. It's a gathered body of people within and throughout nations. That is a significant change that comes when Christ sends his people out to the ends of the earth and destroys Jerusalem. They're two sides of the same coin, sending out into the world and destroying Jerusalem, two sides of the same coin. So they're, they're two points of application. But what I think is the most significant way that we apply this book is, is what I call don't build a bunker, plant a tree. So, so what I mean by that is when people take this book as though it is about our future, they, they rightly think, well, if there's going to be locusts arising out of the earth to sting people and a beast that's going to arise and persecute everyone who doesn't worship it and giant hailstones falling from the sky, I better get ready for that. I'll build a bunker in the back garden. I'll get ready to hunker down. Yeah, and I, and I even met someone recently, you know, a real person who was so convinced that we were getting near to the events of this book that he was moving his family to Iceland to live in the wilderness. <laughs> if you don't laugh, you'll cry. But the point is that we're reading the judgments in this book in, you know, they are in our past. What we're told is that we are living under Christ's reign, which is extending. Sa Satan is losing more and more power. You know, it doesn't mean that there won't be flares of things getting worse. But even when the most successful uh, businesses, for instance, were to, to measure their growth, it's not like it's a perfect line upwards. There's there's bits where it does this. You know, there, there are dips. It's the same thing. Just because we're saying the kingdom of Christ is growing, we're not saying, and nothing will ever go wrong as it grows. And so we shouldn't be hunkering down, ready for everything to go to pot. We should be investing in the future, thinking big, long term, planning for the day when everyone in this country knows the Lord. You know, this is why if you go to church buildings built in the 1700s, for instance, a lot of Anglican churches, for instance, you'll find they have far too many seats. And, and some people go there and they think, oh, what a shame that, that these seats aren't filled anymore. The reality is they never were filled. The people who built these churches had this expectation and hope that one day Jesus' reign would extend to the point that these churches are going to be chock-a-block full. And so we want to be ready for that. We want to have church buildings that can be ready for the flood to come in. Now, I know it's easy to be discouraged by you know, looking at the state of the church in this country. But bear in mind, the kingdom is bigger than the UK or even the West. And the reality is that the church globally has never been as big as it is today. And it's only growing. It's only a matter of time before that starts to trickle down into all these other countries. So when I say don't build a bunker, plant a tree, what I'm saying is we're not expecting all these judgments from Revelation to happen in our future. They happened in the past. Our expectation is that Christ's reign is is extending. You know, no one plants a tree in a garden that they know is going to be gone in the next few weeks. But this garden, this garden that we're called to be in, is only going to get sweeter, as Revelation 20 to 22 teach us. So we want to be people who are investing in this world, knowing that it's Christ's world and his reign is extending. So this book is profoundly relevant to us, not just because it fills in our covenant history, but because it speaks of what Christ achieved through the destruction of Jerusalem and what will be achieved as a result of his reign. 
And, yeah, and as I say, there's lots of different ways we can apply it to us. There's one meaning with plenty of applications. So I, I know that was a quick overview of it, but I hope you can see how this book really is relevant and it really is applicable. And just because it's about events in our past for the most of it, you know, up to chapter 19, it doesn't mean that this book has to become a, a forgotten history book at the back of the Bible. It is profoundly relevant for all Christians of all ages, just as when you pick up Hosea, for instance, and you're reading about unfaithful Israel, or when you pick up Amos and read about the first temple that's about to be destroyed, or when you pick up Lamentations and you read Jeremiah reflecting on the fact that the temple has been destroyed, we don't pick it up and we go, well, this doesn't affect me. We pick it up and we learn from God's word by looking at how he's dealt through his people throughout covenant history. So I hope that's been helpful. I really hope you've enjoyed this series. I I've certainly enjoyed putting it together. And as I say, it's a shame that we haven't been able to look at loads of different passages and kind of looking at how they fit into the book's topic. Um, I'm sorry I've not been able to do that. I would love to have done that. But uh, as I say, if, if there's any specific areas or points or anything you just want to ask me about, you're more than welcome to do so. I'd be more than well, uh, happy to talk about it. I can give uh, book recommendations or even tell you, you know, the best arguments from the other side. So uh, thank you for joining me in, in these last eight parts. It's been a, lot, a real pleasure to do that and it's been a lot of fun. So uh, thanks a lot and uh, bye for now.